two people said hi. Hello, everyone. Hey. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today, I'm here to talk to you all about SRE versus DevOps. I know this is a really hot topic for many of you, um, and we're going to kind of get down into it uh, and really dig into how these two uh, paradigms either relate or don't relate to one another. If you don't know me, my name is Seth. I'm a developer relations engineer at Google. Um, prior to that, I worked at HashiCorp. Prior to that, I worked at Chef Software. Uh, I've been involved in kind of the DevOps movement for realistically about six years now. Uh, and that's my Twitter handle. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments or negative feedback or positive feedback, feel free to tweet at me uh, during the talk or after the talk. My direct messages are also open, so if you have something to say that you don't feel comfortable saying you know, publicly on the internet, you can always send me a uh, direct message, uh, even if I'm not following you. Cool. So I think it's really important to set a ground level before we start talking about SRE, because uh, a lot of people have different definitions of DevOps. Um, I'm what you might call a DevOps purist. Um, I believe that there are two groups that we talk about when we talk about DevOps. The first is developers, that's where the dev and DevOps comes from. These are people who are concerned with things like agility, they're concerned with shipping code, delivering features, and bringing value to their customers. And then on the other side, we have people called operators. And those operators are concerned with things like stability. They're concerned with making sure systems are up to date, making sure that there's no security vulnerabilities, and making sure that the status quo keeps running. You know, is our website still running? Are we still making money? Are our customers still happy? And until we really started talking about DevOps, what happened was these two teams, these two groups of people, didn't communicate. Uh, or if they did, it was, it was very sporadic, it was very haphazard. Instead, developers would write code, and then they would throw that code over the metaphorical wall to the operators. So we have these people who are responsible for writing code, and again, they're responsible for things like agility. So they want to ship things, they want to deliver new features, uh, they want to bring new value to customers, throwing a bunch of work over to a group of people who are inherently against change, because change introduces instability. It introduces the probability for things to break. Additionally, there's a skills gap between these two groups. On the left-hand side, right-hand side, the developers are traditionally uh, Software engineers, computer scientists, people with formal uh, degrees or training programs in some type of computer uh, field. And on the left-hand side, we have operators who are generally self-taught uh, or they've gone through you know, two-year associates programs. They don't have a background in things like algorithms or uh, efficiency. So in addition to these developers over here writing code and throwing it over the wall, we have a group of operators on the left-hand side who don't have the expertise to be able to debug that code when it breaks or the necessary experience to be able to you know, fix that code in the event of an error. But then on the flip side, these operators have a ton of experience with things like networking and storage, things that developers don't even think about, like how do you configure a RAID array? Right? How do you make sure that this backup is actually redundant? Uh, how many network links do we need to achieve this level of bandwidth? So, there's no knowledge sharing going on, right? We have really, really specialized data on both sides of this wall here, the developers and the operators, but they're not talking and they're not communicating. And there's a few reasons for this. The first is that developers are generally physically located in a different place. So before the cloud and before many companies were adopting the cloud, these operators generally had their offices and their desks in a data center. Whereas the developers were physically located in kind of the corporate office. They were sitting right next to the CIOs and the VPs and the directors. So the operators often lost these battles because the developers were physically closer to the leadership. So this caused a lot of tension. And the operators had a lot of value to add back, but because they were physically separated and academically separated, they didn't have a, a vehicle in which to give that feedback back to the developers. So this is where we started seeing slowdowns. This is where we started seeing one deploy a year because that's how long it took the operators to evaluate the changes uh, and that's how long it took the developers to convince the operators that these were safe changes. And this wasn't good for the business. And I don't advocate you know, measuring deploys per day as a metric for success, but if you're only deploying once per year, that's a really bad signal. So what is DevOps? 
So it all started with breaking down this barrier. In its purest definition, DevOps is literally just removing that wall. Um, it doesn't actually say how, it just says break down that wall between developers and operators. And there's a few key ways, five key ways, in which the DevOps movement stresses how to reduce that wall or how to break down that wall. One thing I do want to point out though is that uh, modern DevOps, I'm using air quotes, um, doesn't refer to just developers and operators. We also include people like security teams, you might have heard DevSecOps is the new buzzword, but it also includes things like marketing and product uh, and even leadership. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But in the purest definition, it was developers and operators. But once we broke down those walls, we found another bottleneck. We found security. Great, okay, developers and operators are talking together. We broke down these walls. We're trying to deploy, but oops, security, legal, and privacy is blocking our deploy because they still have a waterfall-based approach. They still have a queuing system, and they still lack the context in order to uh, speed up this process. So we're seeing this idea of breaking down organizational barriers spreading across other organizational units, but at the beginning it was just developers and operators. So there are five key pieces of the DevOps movement. The first, which I've kind of emphasized a little bit, is reducing organizational silos. Again, there are a number of ways that you do this. In the purest way, you, you put the operators and the developers in the same room together. Um, this was something that was not happening. Again, operators were at a data center, developers were at the corporate headquarters. They often didn't even share a time zone because the data center was you know, in the middle of the country and the developers were on the East Coast or the West Coast. Um, and just by putting them in the same room, you can reduce organizational silos. But there are other ways that we can do this as well. We can incentivize collaboration with things like peer bonuses or joint projects or hackathons within your own organization. There are a number of ways to reduce organizational silos, but the first key piece of the DevOps movement is to break down those barriers between teams, between developers and operators, between operators and security, etc. The second piece that came out of that was to accept failure as normal. One of the reasons why there was so much resistance from the operators in the DevOps movement was because they were so resistant to change. And the reason they were resistant to change was because change inherently means instability. Change inherently means failure or, or possible failure. And that scares people, right? I have my app, it's working, don't touch it. Um, and I've worked at companies where there's still some PHP script that's running in production that moves some data from over here to over there and no one touches it because no one knows how it works. And I'm sure that some of you work in that same type of industry. Um, and that's okay, but we have to accept failure as normal. So we have to understand that systems are inherently going to fail. And that can't just be developers and operators. That has to be executive leadership saying, hey, I understand that by pushing new features and delivering more value to customers, we're also introducing risk. Because those, bug, uh, those features might have bugs, there might be edge cases, we might break things. But it's all in service of delivering new functionality. So we have to accept that failure is normal. Without us willing to accept that computers are inherently unreliable and humans are even more unreliable, we can't actually practice DevOps. We have to accept failure is normal. And there are another, a number of things out of this, like blameless postmortems, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But we have to just understand that failure is going to happen. It's not something that we can prevent. It's something we can mitigate, but we cannot prevent it. One of the ways that we mitigate failure is by implementing gradual change. And that's the third piece of the DevOps movement. When we're shipping in a waterfall style development, where we have hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and we ship every six months or every year, it's impossible to break down which exact line of code broke something. If instead we're shipping very small pieces of code, we're changing a few lines here, we're changing some functionality there, and we have metrics and monitoring on the other side, we have observability, we can see when a particular change breaks. So instead of a developer or an operator needing to go through hundreds of thousands of lines of code for a six month deploy to see which thing broke the CSS and the button on the front end, we can deploy those individually. And this is a key piece of the DevOps movement. We need to implement gradual change. Uh, we can't just be like throwing a billion things out there at once. It makes it hard for us to predict what's going to happen and it also, plays into the previous thing, is that if we accept that our code is going to have bugs and that our changes are going to have failures, we want them to be as small as possible and impact as little as possible. 
The fourth piece of the DevOps movement is to leverage tooling and automation. Um, in the SRE world, we have this thing called toil, which I'll talk about in detail in a second. But one of the things we found kind of looking, and, and a number of different organizations have surveyed this, like Dora, uh, is that organizations, the, the operators and organizations, were spending so much time doing the same thing over and over and over again. Creating users, installing packages, patching the system, installing various operating system patches and kernel patches, that they didn't actually have time to bring value to the system. So instead of actually bringing value, like uh, improving performance or improving reliability or improving network throughput, they were just keeping up with the status quo. And that was because humans can only type so fast and the surface area only increases. So we have to leverage tooling and automation. And this is where DevOps is really cool to me because we have folks on the right-hand side, the developers, who have traditional software engineering backgrounds. And then we have folks on the left-hand side who are operators who have deep systems engineering knowledge. And when we bring them together and we put them in the same room, they build really fantastic tools. Tools like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, Terraform. Right? That's really where those tools came from, is we had operators who needed to solve a problem and developers who were willing to apply their experience to build those tools and technologies. And because of that, we can now automate fleets of thousands or hundreds of thousands of VMs and provision you know, millions and millions of services and microservices because we brought those groups together. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is to measure everything. None of this matters, none of those other four things matter if you don't have a critical gauge of success. If you don't have a way to measure your organizational silos. How do you measure organizational silos? Well, how long does it take code to move through a pipeline from the moment that it's written until it's available in production to 100% of your users? That's a metric. That's a metric that you can easily automate. It's a metric that you can graph over time. And it's a metric that you can raise to stakeholders like your directors and your executives to show just how much DevOps is improving your organization. Same thing with failure, right? We have postmortems; those are qualitative things, but we also have uh, monitoring and logging, traditional monitoring and logging. Is my service up? Is my service down? Implementing gradual change, again, we can monitor and, and create metrics around all of this. And leveraging tooling and automation, we can chart how long it takes to provision new VMs and new services and optimize that over time. If we don't have any of those numbers, it's very difficult to go back to your vice president or your director in a year and say, we did DevOps. And your director says, great, we spent you know, 100,000 euros on this project. Now what? What do you have to show for it? So you have to measure things. We have to measure everything so that we can prove success, but also so that we can define our own success. But you might notice something about all of these things. Um, they're really very abstract ideas. Reduce organizational silos. I gave you one example, how you do that, put them in the same room, but that's a really abstract idea. Measure everything. Notice that I didn't tell you what tools or technology to measure everything. I didn't tell you if you should use a yardstick or a meter. Um, that was a US-UK joke, for those of you that didn't get it. Um, I, I didn't tell you how to implement gradual change, just that you should do it. And now we're going to flip gears a little bit. Um, the DevOps principles don't tell you how to do anything. Um, they tell you what you should do, and then it's your responsibility to implement them. So in this way, you can think of DevOps as like an abstract class or an interface in programming. It defines the end result, like sortable or collectible, but it doesn't actually tell you how to get there. Right? If you're in something like Java and you want to implement a sortable interface, you just write some code. But the code that you write dramatically changes based off of what you're implementing. Are they integers? Are they strings? Are they floats? Um, are they random objects? Right? All of that varies. And the same is true with, with DevOps. A lot of these kind of abstract ideas are very different depending on the organization that you're in or the industry that you're a part of. So one of the things that we kind of independently arrived at at Google was that SRE implements DevOps. And I'll explain SRE here in a little bit. So Google's been practicing SRE since kind of as early as 2001, 2002, but we didn't really talk about it publicly until very, very recently. The biggest reason for that is that we felt SRE, which stands for Site Reliability Engineering, was our secret sauce. We thought that as a cloud provider and as a service provider, Site Reliability Engineering was the thing that gave us an edge over all of our competitors. It's the reason that we could have 5,000 
SREs at Google and over 100,000 full-time employees who support all of the various systems like Gmail and Drive and Docs. Um, and we thought that that was like a thing that we should never talk about. Um, but then as more and more people adopted our cloud platform, we found that when you go to a customer and you say, oh, well, what's your SLO for you know, 98th percentile request latency for this region, they look at you and go, hmm. <laughs> right? So when we're, when, you know, this made a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense to keep this a secret whenever we were our only users, right? When the only people using Google was Google. And now that we're a cloud provider and that we're offering our services to you in the form of compute, networking, and storage, and managed services, we have to speak the same language. Um, and we think it's really important for the industry to understand how we talk about availability, reliability, and DevOps. And at Google, we call that SRE. So the little star disclaimer that I'm obligated to say is that even though SRE was not explicitly created to satisfy the DevOps interface, it was created to solve very similar problems. OK, so let's look at how. How does SRE eliminate organizational silos? Well. First, we share ownership with developers and SREs, or site reliability engineers, the people practicing this, what, what the industry might call operators or sysadmins. There are a number of ways that we do this. We do this through things like uh, sharing the same tools. So if you're a developer, what we call a SWE, a software engineer at Google, or an SRE, you use the same set of tools. In fact, you get the same base image, the same base laptop, the same VM that runs all of the same tools and technologies. So if you're a developer and you're on call, you have access to the same tools and technologies that an SRE has when they're on call. In fact, there's often joint debugging sessions between the two. So developers are improving those tools, SREs are improving those tools. It's a shared responsibility around the tool chain. Additionally, SREs share ownership with developers through this thing we call error budgets. And we'll talk about that in more detail, but in very short, it means that Operators and developers agree how available a system should be, what its uptime should be, what its critical metrics are. And then whenever that starts decreasing, it's everyone's responsibility to own that downtime. The way we do that is accepting failure as normal. And we have a few things in the SRE practice that do that. Um, SLOs and blameless postmortems. And we'll talk about SLOs in detail in a little bit, but I'll give you a quick overview. Uh, SLOs stand for service level objectives. Um, they are, you can think of them as a pre-SLA, right? The SLA is the thing that if you break, you have to give money back to a customer. Ideally, you want something internally that breaks first before you give your money back to customers. Um, an SLO is, is a metric like the 95th percentile for response latency is under 500 milliseconds for the past five minutes, right? So it's an, it's an integral, it's a calculus of some metric over time. Um, and we quantify those metrics and then share ownership. So anytime that SLO drops below the threshold, it's the developer's responsibility, the SRE's responsibility, and the executive responsibility, whether that's product or, or an engineering manager, to own that failure. Additionally, we practice blameless postmortems. Um, at Google, we've always practiced blameless postmortems, but it's also a critical part of the SRE process. Um, our postmortems are a little bit different than you might experience in your own organization because we also include people like communications, marketing, uh, PR, in addition to the engineering and the developers. So when we do a postmortem, it's not just what happened wrong in the code, it's also how did we communicate about it externally, what did it look like on social media, right? There's a lot more to it than just the engineering pieces, but we still do all of that, and it's all blameless. We implement gradual change. Um, to reduce, the mean, uh, to reduce the cost of failure. So um, we have these badges that you get internally. Uh, and if you submit really small changes, you get nicer badges. Um, so we incentivize that. Um, we also leverage tooling and automation. Uh, this is a really big one. Um, like I said before, we share the same set of tools as software engineers and site reliability engineers. But at the same time, uh, we have this really quantitative measure of wasted time called toil which I'll, I'll define in a little bit more in a later slide, but your goal as an SRE or even a software engineer who's working on production systems is to, to automate this year's job away. So we do regular studies internally where we survey SREs and uh, engineers who are on call, and we ask them, you know, this year, what did you spend most of your time doing? And then we challenge them and say, hey, can that be automated? And sometimes it's not worth it, right? If once a year you have to run some command that fixes a thing, it's probably not worth automating. 
But when it starts happening three or four or five times, we should be automating that. And that's a core Google principle, and it's a core SRE principle, is to automate this year's job away. And lastly, we measure everything. We fundamentally believe that operations is a software problem. Um, and thus, we measure everything, we minimize toil, we have metrics for our metrics. And just to give you an example, um, all of our postmortems have high-level metrics around the root cause or root causes and classification. We then aggregate all of our postmortems into an internal system and trend the root causes of our root causes. And that's where statistics like 30% uh, of all Google outages internally have been caused by configuration changes. And that's because we are measuring the metrics of our postmortems. Um, so we take measurement to a, a next level. But hopefully um, this is clearer why we say class R SRE implements DevOps. Um, we're not saying that SRE is DevOps um, because there are pieces of SRE that aren't in kind of this DevOps model. Um, and there are other ways to do these various functions, right? Uh, at Google, we use this thing called Stackdriver uh, to do measurement. Um, and if you're an SRE, we would encourage you to use Stackdriver. But you can still practice DevOps without using a tool like Stackdriver. You could use any monitoring, logging, and alerting stack that you'd like. So let's dive into this a little more. Um, so there's these three three-letter acronyms, SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. So SLAs are service level agreements. These are contractual obligations that you have between your legal department or your company and some other company that provides a certain level of availability. So you say our service will be available 99.99% of the time and for every 10 minutes that it's not available, we will give you $5,000 in credit back. Um, and this is something that's negotiated, often part of a sales agreement. We then have SLOs, which are a tighter measurement. So if our SLA is four nines, our SLO might be four and a half or even five nines of availability. Again, because we want that to break before we have to give money back to the customer. We would like our people to be paged. Um, and then we have these things called SLIs, which are service level indicators. And these are smaller pieces of information. Sorry. For example, a service level indicator might be something like request latency right now. Like if I were to take a slice what is request latency right now? What are the number of requests per second I have right now? How many failures are there per request? So these are often aggregated over time and then converted into some kind of rate, uh, average, or percentile that are subject to some threshold, right, to, to throw out anomalies. For example, you might say something like the 99th percentile for request latency must be less than 250 milliseconds, or the ratio of requests to errors must be less than 1%. The ratio of 200s to 500s must be less than 1%. So then an SLO is the integral of those SLIs over a time period. So the SLI defines kind of a binary operation. It's up or down, or it's okay or not okay. But then when we integrate that over time for a target availability window, like five minutes or 10 minutes or the past 30 days, we, might, we get a much better uh, understanding of our service availability. So if one moment in time our service is down, that, that sucks, but it's one moment in time. But if we have 10 moments in time or 100 moments in time in which our service is down, that's very, very bad. And that's really what we're concerned about, is what does this look like over time? What is the trend? For example, we might seek to have 99th percentile latency, um, the SLA we described earlier, but we want it to be available for 99.9% .9 of the time. So 0.1% of the time it can fail, but it must be available, it must be up, or it must be satisfied for 99.9% .9 of the time. And then as I said before, an SLA is generally a sales agreement or a legal agreement between the customer and the service provider, uh, you and your company. They're typically based on SLOs, they don't have to be. Um, they are both a sales tactic and a legal tactic for you to be protected from a company and from a company to be protected from you uh, potentially not delivering a level of service. So, to think about it this way, SLIs drive SLOs, which then inform but don't determine the SLAs. So it's very common, like I said before, for an SLO to have a much tighter uh, requirement than an SLA. And I, that's because we want the SLO to break before the SLA breaks. And then you can't have an SLO without the SLIs because the SLIs determine the metrics and the success criteria for those metrics. The SLO is just over time. It's an integral, or if you would imagine you were to graph that over time, 
That's really what an SLO is. So one of the things I talked about on the earlier slide was sharing ownership. That's one of the ways we reduce organizational silos. At Google and in the SRE practice, when we're defining these SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs, it's not just like some engineer sits down at their desks and write down some numbers. It's an incredibly collaborative process between the SREs, the product owners, the developers, and the sales teams, uh, and what we call customer engineers. So it's not like someone wakes up one morning and says, I think Spanner should have five nines of availability, and then we go out and sell that, right? That's not how it works. There's quantitative and analytical uh, data that goes into all of these decisions. But the SLAs are negotiated as part of a sales deal. They're bound by the SLOs. And then the SREs work with product teams to form both the SLIs and SLOs. In general, SREs are not involved in kind of the sales and customer side of things, except in you know, edge cases. Um, so generally, that's between the sales organization and the customer. But the product teams, the engineering teams, and the SREs work together to determine the SLIs and SLOs. So let's say we've formed our SLO, and we say, OK, our service must be 99.9% .9 reliable. Uh, I think that gives it, or 99.99% reliable, that gives it 30 minutes of downtime a year. Um, when we exceed that, because we had a bad deploy, um, what happens? What prevents developers from just saying, well, screw it, like, we, already broke, we already broke the SLO, why would we, you know, we might as well push new changes out. And this is where these things called error budgets come in. So striving for 100% availability is, isn't just impossible, it's also irresponsible. Um, no service can be 100% available uh, unless the industry dictates it, uh, like a helicopter should be 100% available. Um, or like a medical device should be 100% available. Um, but no other service, particularly when we're dealing with like microservices and things on the internet, internet connected devices, um, should be 100% available. And that's because maximizing for stability decreases our ability to deliver new features. And that's because each new feature we deliver introduces risk. And if we strive for 100% availability, once it's working, we should never touch it. And that just takes us back in time to where we were before at the beginning of this talk where operators were like, don't touch my system, it works, and developers were like, but new features, but new features. And we want to avoid that. The reason this is important, though, is that maximizing stability limits how quickly new features can be delivered to your users, but your users typically don't notice an extreme availability because they're limited by other factors in their chain. So let's take a look at an example. This is an Android phone in two-dimensional space. On most cellular network providers, if you look at your contract, they guarantee you a 99% SLA. That means your network provider is available 99% of the time within a service range. So if you are in your network coverage area, they guarantee two nines of availability. So if your user is a mobile user, they are using your app, and they are connecting to a cellular tower, and your cellular tower has 100% availability with your data center. You have somehow managed to be 100% available. You have zero microseconds of downtime. Your user will never notice because they are fundamentally limited by the 99% that exists between their mobile device and the cellular tower. So you're optimizing for something that your users will never experience. And you can imagine that there are situations where you've been affected by this. You've tried to visit a, a website on your mobile phone. It doesn't load. You click refresh. You blame your cellular provider. You're at home. You try to visit a website. It doesn't load. You blame your internet service provider. You do a quick refresh, and it's now available. And that's because those providers are only guaranteeing you, you know, two or three nines of availability. Therefore, they don't have to deliver 100% uptime. And because they're not delivering 100% uptime, the vast majority of your users will never experience 100% uptime. It's an unrealistic target. And in fact, you're just hindering your ability to deliver new services and functionality for something that your end users will never actually experience. And again, there are edge cases here, right? If you're working in military or medical, 100% uptime is something that we should strive for. Right? We can't have a medical device that functions 99% of the time, right? especially if it's a life-saving device like a CPAP or a rebreather. Right? So we're talking about systems, systems-level engineering, what I imagine that most of you work on or interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but there are edge cases here.
But in general, right, unless it's you know, life depending, most services don't have 100% availability. Therefore, you optimizing to have 100% availability on the back end is just overkill. It's not actually giving you any benefit. So how do we determine how much risk a service can tolerate? Like I said, at Google, we didn't just wake up one morning and be like, Spanner, five nines of availability. Sounds good to me. Um, there are many factors to consider, like fault tolerance, the networking model, our testing time, how frequently we want to deliver new features, whether we're doing canaries, whether we have alpha and beta groups. There's a huge matrix of, of factors that we decide on. Um, and the acceptable risk dictates the SLIs and the SLOs. The SLOs then mathematically correspond to this thing called the error budget. So if our service incurs too much downtime, we have to reduce risk, meaning we have to reduce the number of deploys, or we have to only focus on availability in order to remain within our target SLO. If a service owner, like a, a product manager, for example, wants to deliver a new feature, um, and they care about delivering new functionality and getting customer feedback, they'll probably pick a lower SLO, something like 95%, because they want to have the flexibility of pushing something bad out without breaking the SLA or breaking the SLO, because they're evolving rapidly. Whereas when we look at something like data layers, like databases, we probably want a higher level of availability, because one, those tools are already pretty stable. They've been kind of tried and tested. And also, we, we can't have our data layer going down, right? That means almost everything is unavailable. So as long as the SLOs are met, releases can continue. We continue pushing new software and pushing new functionality. But what happens if an SLO breach occurs or an SLO breach is about to occur? Well, product management and SREs kind of set the expectation for how much time a service should be up. Um, they agree on various metrics, various SLOs. Uh, and usually that's per quarter or per half. For other services, it might be per day or per month. But you define some, some aggregate metric, let's just say per quarter. So you say my service must be 99.9% .9 SLO for these various metrics within a quarter. And whenever you exceed that SLO, you're done. You can't push new features. You can only push features that focus on reliability. You can only push changes and bug fixes that improve the reliability of the system. And that uptime is measured by a neutral third party. It's measured by a monitoring system, right? So it's not like the SREs wake up one day and they're like, hmm, well, this system feels 99% reliable today, right? Instead, we have graphs. Everyone loves graphs. Um, <clears throat> so these are screenshots of real graphs that I pulled internally. Um, this is uh, the top here. We have the health. Uh, this is the, a particular service. We're measuring uh, the health of the number of requests that are under 300 milliseconds. And towards the right hand here, you can see that there's a big drop in that graph. That means there's an increase in the number of requests that are over 300 seconds. It's a little bit weird to think about. Um, in the middle graph, in the green bar here, we have compliance, which is the number of requests that are under 300 milliseconds. And you can see that we're you know, f pretty flappy there in the beginning, but then we're generally OK. But right around this dotted line here in the middle, we can start to see a significant drop in the, in the request latency there or a significant increase in the request latency, which corresponds to a drop in the number of requests that are under 300 milliseconds. And then at the very bottom, we're graphing our budget. So just like you graph your budget in your bank account, where you have a certain number of euros, and you pay your bills, and that gradually goes down, and then you get a paycheck, and it gradually goes up, what you're seeing here is our error budget over time gradually increases as the quarter goes along. But then when we have an outage, because we violated our SLO here, we see a drastic decrease in our error budget. And if that error budget reaches this bottom line, which is zero, we can't push code anymore. Our developers are fundamentally blocked from pushing code. And this is because the product owners, the SREs, and the executive leadership have agreed that this is the SLO target. Now the only features and functionality that we can push are around improving reliability. And this is agreed upon and respected across the organization. So it's not like the developers can just go to their boss and say, hey, the SREs won't let us push code. Because this is agreed upon the organization, that this is the way we measure uptime and availability, and this is how we care about these things. Another thing I want to talk about in the SRE culture is this thing called toil. Um, when I first heard the word toil, my first reaction was like, why didn't you just use an existing word? Why did you make up a word? And then I realized that all words are made up words. Um, if you think about it. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized that we actually do need a unique word to describe this type of work. 
Toil is best defined as what it's not. Um, so toil is not things like expense reports, checking email, going to meetings, traveling to conferences, or commuting to work. Instead, toil is work that is manual, repetitive, automatable, uh, incredibly tactical, but devoid of long-term value. So if you have to SSH into a production system to restart a service, the first time you do that, it's probably not toil. You brought the service online. In fact, if you do that once a year, it's not toil. If you do that once a month, once a week, once a day, it becomes toil. And toil can lead to really bad things. It can lead to things like career stagnation. If all you do all day is restart services, you are not building new functionality, you are not adding uh, value to the system, and you're slowing things down, right? It can hinder promotion, it can hinder career progress. It's also just not good for the organization or your own personal morale. Like, can you imagine walking into work all day and all you do is hit a button? Restart, 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 right? You're probably gonna quit because that's not a very exciting and exhilarating job. You're not being challenged academically um, or, or emotionally and it's taxing. It's not good for you, it's not good for the organization. So toil is the kind of work that's tied to running a production service that tends to be all of these things. Um, but it also has one other characteristic, which is that it scales linearly as the service grows. So if you have a thousand users and you have to create, you have to do, perform some operation once per day, if you scale to 10,000 users, you now have to perform that same operation, say five or 10 times per day. This is usually an indication that that work should be automated or you should put pressure on the development team to fix whatever is causing that critical pressure. Whether it's an algorithm that can be improved or building some automation or improving the health checks of the service so that it's restarted automatically. Toil is very, very, very bad, but it's also a great learning opportunity. And if you've ever worked in the operations space, you know that when you're dumped into a new system, um, it's really difficult to reason about. Uh, if you have 100,000 services uh, at Google scale or even 50 at a startup scale and someone new joins the company and they're expected to be on call, Toil or toily tasks are actually one of the best ways to introduce them to the system. You know, SSH, tail dash F, grep this file, see what this is. That's a great way to understand the exposure of the system. So most SREs at Google try to eliminate about 90% of toil. They keep about 10% of toil around. Um, and that's because there are certain tasks that just aren't worth automating. It would take six weeks to automate this task that takes 10 seconds to run once a year. It's not worth investing, right? It's not a good return on investment. The other reason that some SREs keep toil around is sometimes you've had a really bad day and you need a quick win. How many people have ever been in that spot? Where you're like, everything is broken, I hate computers, why was I not a pastry chef? Okay, a service that I can just restart, okay. And then you can go home for the day and you feel good about yourself. Um, and, and toil in very short bursts is good at satisfying that human need for, or for satisfaction. Um, so the goal is not to eliminate toil, but it's to reduce it to only what is necessary for personal satisfaction and maximizing ROI. So I've really only touched the surface of this whole SRE thing. Um, and like we say, class SRE implements DevOps. There are things in SRE that are not part of DevOps. Um, for example, we have like tokens that teams can use to escalate things over top of another team to get their push, you know, their thing pushed out. And we have a lot of things around security and interfacing with other teams that aren't really part of the core DevOps movement. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, we've written two books at Google, both of which are free. Um, that means zero euros, zero dollars. Um, it's at google.com slash SRE, Site Reliability Engineering. That'll take you to a landing page where you can learn all about this stuff. You can also download both of these books for free. There's the Site Reliability Engineering Workbook. I like to call this the theoretical book. This is like theoretical calculus, um, where like there's a bunch of graphs and charts and things that should work. Um, and then you walk away and you're kind of like, huh, huh. And then the one on the right is the Site Reliability Engineering Workbook. Uh, this is like the practical workbook. This is the problem set, if you will, that accompanies that theoretical calculus book where you actually get hands-on and, and do the math. Again, both of these are completely free in PDF form. You can also buy them if you like a physical hard copy from O'Reilly. 
uh, the publisher, but you, they're completely free in PDF form. You can download them, uh, put them on your mobile device and read them. Um, but they're super useful. They go into a lot more detail than I can go into in about 40 minutes. Um, there's also a series that my colleague Liz and I have done called SRE versus DevOps, Competing Standards or Friends. Um, they're short five minute videos that you can watch yourself or share with your colleagues that go into very, very little bits of information about how DevOps and SRE relate. <coughs> so I want to leave some time for questions. So we'll kind of wrap it up here since I know this is a contentious topic. I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. Um, is SRE DevOps 2.0? Um, no. SRE is not trying to be DevOps 2.0. It's not trying to be DevOps uh, either. It's, it's saying that this is a way that you can satisfy the DevOps interface. There are other ways to satisfy the DevOps interface. And just like DevOps, where you can pick and choose what you adopt, the same is true for SRE. Right? If you only want to pick and choose from the SRE model because you have a small company or because you already have a solution for monitoring and logging and alerting, that's fine. Right? We're not here to sell you DevOps in a box, and we're not here to sell you SRE in a box. Similarly, is SRE trying to take over DevOps? I think hopefully this presentation made it clear that they're very symbiotic. They work together. In fact, they share a lot of the core principles. Um, no, it's not. Can I adopt both DevOps and SRE? Um, this is an interesting one. Um, if you adopt SRE, you are most likely doing DevOps. If you adopt DevOps, you might not be doing SRE. It's like all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares, right? Uh, it goes back to the abstract class thing, right? DevOps is, is an abstract class or an interface, and SRE implements it. But if you satisfy the interface in a different way, you're not doing SRE necessarily, but you're still doing DevOps. I get this question a lot. Uh, is DevOps dead? Um, I think that's like a whole different subject that could warrant its own hour long talk. Um, no, like at least I hope not, because really in like the purest definition, DevOps is about being human to one another. Uh, if I were to define it in like an elevator pitch, it's like be nice to one another and talk. Um, and I hope that that doesn't go away, right? I, I don't think SRE or ProdOps or DevOps are, are moving away from that. In fact, I think we're seeing more and more adoption. I think it's becoming the norm. Um, what you might be seeing is that people aren't talking about it as much because it's becoming the norm. Um, the, the video series that I mentioned earlier is part of two academic courses in the United States. Um, DevOps is being introduced into classrooms for college students. These, these topics are becoming mainstream. Um, and that might feel like it's dying, right? That might feel like no one's talking about it anymore. Um, but nobody talks about addition anymore. But I promise that addition is still very important. And like people just do it now. And I think that's really a win, right? Um, if, if it becomes so normal that we don't think about it anymore, that it becomes part of our practices, it's included in every job description, it's a necessary requirement, like a communication skill. Can, can you practice DevOps as a developer or an operator or a sysadmin or an SRE? If, if that's just a thing that's assumed to be uh, necessary on resumes and various things, then I think we've won. Um, so just because people aren't talking about it as much anymore doesn't mean that it's dead. Um, is your talk over? Yes. Um, I wanted to leave ample room for questions because I know this is a pretty hot topic and there's some confusion around it. Um, so that's my Twitter handle. Uh, if you have questions, please yell them and I will repeat them and attempt to answer them as best I can. Thank you.